OK, so let me, let's continue. We're going to spend about half an hour on the accumbens, because it's going to be mainly covered by Marina tomorrow. And then uh, we'll do the paper, OK? Good. So the reason why we went to the accumbens is in part because of its uh, pivotal role in integrating different excitatory inputs. So as you can see from this slide, that short so shows some of the major connections in the accumbens. We have excitatory inputs from the ventral hippocampus, the medial prefrontal cortex, and also from the BLA. And that converges onto these medium spiny neurons, which then either project back to the midbrain, and so these would be the analogous of the, the, uh, the direct pathway neurons, so the D1s, or they could go to uh, intermediate uh, areas like the ventral pallidum. And the reason why this is interesting, because there is a lot of literature that indicates that this anatomical layout would suggest an integration of different function. So it's been argued that action outcome is something that arises from activity in the middle prefrontal cortex, that context dependence would be mediated by activity from ventral hippocampus, and that the valence, that is, whether it's positive or negative, would be coded in activity in the BLA upstream. And the integration would then occur here in the medium spiny neurons. OK, so if we want to test this and put this in perspective of addiction, we want to use the blueprint that I already showed you. We want to have a drug adaptive behavior. We want to do drug evoked synaptic plasticity ex vivo, analyze this to develop strategy to reverse in vitro and apply them in vivo. And after some discussion, the behavior we settle for is Q-associated seeking in mice, which is a established model of relapse. So the way that works is that you have the association of cocaine and a light Q. So whenever the animal presses here, there is a Q coming on and it receives an injection of cocaine. So once the animal has learned that, you can then go and impose a withdrawal period and bring back in the test situation the animal to the cage where it is actually unhooked from the cocaine injection and the simple presentation of the cue when it presses the lever will initiate, will trigger a strong seeking behavior. Okay, so in the absence of cocaine during the test session, you have the seeking for the cocaine by pressing the active but not the inactive lever. Obviously, when we started this, there are some technical issues because this test has mainly been done in rats. And as you know, mice are smaller than rats. And that makes it much more difficult to have these cannula patent for the duration of the self-administration. But uh, eventually, we got this to work very nicely. And here are two examples of a mouse that received saline injection over a period of 10 days compared to a mouse that receives cocaine injection. And what you can see here is each black tick is an active lever press. Each red is then an infusion of cocaine. And the blue one are the inactive lever presses. And as you can see, the animal has some interest in that level, even if it only receives an injection of saline, but definitely loses it over time and definitely is not willing to go to what we call a fixed ratio two schedule. That is, here they press once to receive it, here they would have to press twice to receive one injection. And then within 10 days, there's zero interest in these levers. That contrasts with the cocaine where in the beginning we have a lot of blue ticks. So the animal is not really sure which lever to press, but they do learn it within two, three days and certainly are not deterred by the FR2. Go on and here at day 10, you sort of even sort of start to see that they have it quite well under control and they do have their injection such in a periodic fashion that they receive the infusions they need. So this is the group data you see that the change in lever press is obviously triggered by the FR2. 
the disinterest in the inactive liver, and you see that the infusions are really all received. So with that, we have been able to establish this uh, self-administration in mice, and the first thing we wanted to see is whether that leads to any form of synaptic plasticity. So now we're gonna go and do an experiment where we have 10 days of self-administration, followed by the withdrawal, and then recording in the nucleus accumbens. And we wanted to do this, so then uh, with the resolution of the identity of the postsynaptic neurons. We wanted to know whether the recordings were made in D1 receptor expressing um, MSNs or in D2 expressing MSNs. Yes, sir. Well, I had a very question. I just wanted to participate in FL1 and um, FL2. That's what I said. It's fixed ratio one versus fixed ratio two. That is, in FR1, each lever press is rewarded by an injection. In FR2, you have to press twice in order to get an injection. FR15 would be 15 injections followed by. So this is a standard way of, uh, of, of telling that. Okay, and then when we did these recordings, what you can see is that uh, things change in the D1, but not in the D2. So here we plotted the two parameters you're now familiar with, that is the rectification index as a function of umpire NDA ratio. And just to graphically, you see that on average, there's a huge difference here. This is each cell uh, we recorded from, and they're clearly two clouds, but in the D2, under that type of exposure to self-administration of cocaine, not much happens. And so that then let us focus on this uh, D1. While we have a good understanding about which neurons downstream are changed, the way these experiments are done with electrical stimulation in the slice did not allow us to resolve which input underwent that change, okay? So we repeated these experiments with what we call, and others also call, projection, optogenetic projection targeting. So now we're gonna use optogenetics only to have a higher precision of stimulation in the slice preparation. So there's no behavior, there's just a upstream injection in the three major afferent nuclei, MPFC, ventral hippocampus, and BLA, and then the whole self-administration, withdrawal, and then preparation of slices, and then that allows us to do recordings in these slices with the identification of the neurons because while the afferents are green, we can now use transgenic animals where, the, for example, the D1 or the D2 are red. Okay, so we have the contrast, and now we have a full control not only over the output, but also over the input. You understand the approach, which is essentially extension of what uh, Garrett already showed you this morning. Okay, now we repeat this experiment that I showed you initially with pathway resolution. And uh, here in this slide, I'm only gonna show you what happens in the D1 MSNs. And while all the experiments were also done with pathway resolution in the D2, there was no change whatsoever. And so uh, we're gonna focus on these uh, D1. So what you see is that the MPFC input there is, when you look at the AMPA and MDA ratio, again, the AMPA is these fast currents, the NMDA are the slow currents, both measured at plus 40, you see that there is a significant decrease of the AMPA and MDA ratio in that pathway. Conversely, in the ventral hippocampal input, you have a significant increase. And in the BLA, not much changes. You wanna look at the other parameter, which is the rectification. Here, we're now isolating the AMPA transmission. And we're recording at plus 40, zero, and minus uh, 70. And you can see that uh, at baseline, they're pretty linear. So there's no specific change in rectification here, or no presence of rectifying AMPA receptors. However, 
when we look after cocaine, the only trace that really sticks out is this one here, where we have a clear deficit of positive potential, but selectively in the MPFC input. And as a consequence, the current voltage relationship here has this invert rectification, this inflection of the uh, slope, which is not the case in the two other inputs. So with that now, what is your interpretation on the previous slide of the MPFC? Okay, again, decrease umpire MDA ratio, increase umpire MDA ratio, and for the rectification, we have a rectification that appears selectively in this one here. Okay, so the initial interpretation that is easy, we can forget about the BLA because under these circumstances, there is no drug of plasticity. What happens at the mental hippocampal input? What's the most likely interpretation? Yes. Insertion of amp receptors that do or do not contain glue A2. Yeah, so it's glue A2 containing amp receptors in the ventral hippocampus, and that would explain this increase of amp and ratio. Okay, good. We came to the same conclusion. That's reassuring. What's the interpretation for the MPFC? A decrease in what in non A decrease in glue A2 containing. Uh, yeah, uh, because why? Because that would cause a decrease in the amplified MD ratio and would cause there to be an overall increase in rectifying amber sugar current, which is what you showed in this slide. Yeah, so here I would argue that there is an insertion of glue A2 lacking amber receptors, right? That's because if they, they, they need to be here to have the rectification, yes. So why then is the amplitude MDA ratio decreasing if you have actually receptor inserted? I'm not gonna show you this, but NMDA doesn't change in this particular situation. Let's just, let's. Yeah. You, the, 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 this is reasonable that you have the same number of receptors and some of the glue A2 containing are uh, replaced by glue A2 lacking. But why is the amp MDA ratio going down? Yeah, not generally. If you replace that word by something, then your response is correct. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's true, but how specific? <laughs> okay, so the explanation is here where you have, you know, a very small current at positive potential. And while I, I told you that the amp and MDA ratio is measured at plus 40, so at equal number of receptors, the overall current of positive potential will actually go down. And this explains why we have a decrease of amp and MDA ratio. So the specificity is because it's a positive potential. Ooh, not sure I, uh, <laughs> I have everything, everybody on board here. Huh? No? Well, I think in general, wouldn't it be better to, instead of doing like these ratios and whatnot, to instead be measuring amper receptor current directly? I know there's the issue with, you know, the synaptic drive and whatnot, but people have been doing that for years where you record. Sure, I mean, but how do you measure absolute values of amper receptors and NMDA receptors? Well, no, 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 no. Staining is not electrophysiology, right? I mean, as much as I like good pictures, it's not going to give you the function of the current. I mean, you could do an IO plot where you increase the amount of input or light in this case and record the current. And 
Ja. Yeah, but even between two slices, you're not sure whether the I.O. curve has the same steepness because you do not control the number of synapses. I mean, it's formally, of course, you can, you know, one way to do it, and we've done it in the lab, is to control the number of synapses and actually reduce it to one. If you were sure to only activate one, then you could compare absolute values. And the way we did this is by using an artificial source of glutamate that is, we used a uncaging situation. So you can buy glutamate that is caged, so biologically inactive, until it's hit by UV light. And you can activate that with a two-photon laser that has a very small point spread function. And so you generate a tiny little drop of glutamate that is biologically active, and that then uh, is activating these receptors. This is good, but has the disadvantage that, you know, strictly speaking, you're no longer synaptic because you do not know whether you really activate at the true synapse. But, I mean, there are these kind of uh, approaches, and, and certainly if we had the means to do absolute values, it would be extremely helpful. Ratio makes things, the life, more difficult. But this is, you know, I mean, this is not, you know, it's not rocket science here, right? I mean, it's, uh, if, if, if this, by that gets smaller, and the NMDA doesn't change, then obviously Yampan and Eurasia must go down, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, in all, we, we should still be able to calculate that. Okay, so the interpretation is the following, that we actually have contrasting expression mechanism of drug-evoked synaptic plasticity according to the input. MPFC input, building in of calcium permeable AMP receptors, Whereas here we have building in of calcium impermeable glue A2 containing amp receptors and that the BLA not much changes. Okay, now we're here, we're here, and now we have to look how to do the depotentiation. Because as I argued before, the way this happens is through this increased single, condu single channel conductance, even in the case where we have the calcium permeable AMP receptors, they are actually much more conductive, so they potentiate. So uh, a, a rationale to normalize this would consist in using LTD protocols. You can test that. And they come, as in many parts of the brain, in two flavors. Either you can induce LTD through NMDA receptor activation, or you can do this through the activation of metabotropic glutamate receptors that activate G protein couple, G, G proteins, okay? And the big difference is, in order to do NMDA LTD, you need a low frequency stimulation that will very synaptic, in a very specific fashion, depotentiate the synapse that has been activated. Because these MGLORs are located on the edges of the synapses, you need higher stimulation frequencies such that there is a beginning of spill out of the glutamate. And that then triggers this MGLUR LTD, but as we will see, may also have effects on neighboring synapses, okay? But these two protocols actually are very good to tease apart those two, and you can confirm this with pharmacology, which we did. We know that this, uh, MGLUR is particularly interesting in the, in the case here because it can very powerfully, and Marina is going to show you more of that, can very powerfully remove the clue A2 lacking AMP receptors. And we also know from a previous study that this is a complex mechanism of actually synthesis of new clue A2 subunits. But just for the sake of today's talk, Please remember the NMDA is homosynaptic, so only the synapses that have been stimulated, whereas there is heterosynaptic effects because of the higher stimulation frequency. Okay, I'm not gonna show you all the data because you, know, you can think you have two inputs that change. We have two stimulation protocols. We have the cocaine versus the saline, two, two, two. I mean, we're already at, uh, uh, at eight groups. And so it all needs to be done for the D1 and the D2, 16 groups. Um, you know, this was, this was a major effort. And, uh, you know, I have to acknowledge people in the end who actually have done that. I'm just showing you that, you know, depotentiation is possible. 
and you can do it with these two different protocols. And let me now summarize what has happened. Okay, so this is the situation where we have the animal treated with the cocaine and withdrawn. And now we're coming in and we're gonna apply a one hertz protocol selectively on the input for the ventral hippocampus. This is gonna lead at a depotentiation of this synapse only because removing calcium impermeable AMP receptor is efficiently done with NMDA LTD. Okay, we have the other situation where we do a stronger stimulation here, which actually is too strong to activate the LTD pathway, but can have a heterosynaptic effect on this here. When we do the one hertz on the MPFC, this is not a good protocol to remove the calcium permeable AMP receptors, so they will stay and nothing happens in the neighboring input. And finally, when we do the 13 hertz, we have a strong activation of those and a weaker heterosynaptic activation of the ventral hippocampal input, and so we can normalize both. And now, you know, with that validated in the slice preparation, this is great because you have either the normalization of this or the other one, none as a control or both together, right? So this is really the tools that you need to dissect the contribution to the behavior of the plasticity at these specific pathways. So now we can do the behavioral experiment. And for that, we're gonna inject either the MPFC input or the ventral hippocampal input in vivo and then aim, as Garrett said, at the terminal to have an enhanced selectivity. And then we're gonna apply a day before we actually look at the behavior, we're gonna apply these reversal protocols and we have, again, we have four groups, okay? So here's the data. First, the controls, okay? We see that we have, if we do self-administration with saline, there's really not much that is gonna change. So this is gonna be our control here, right? Lever presses, no interest, no Q associated seeking. No big surprise there. When we do the same thing with cocaine, however, there is a seeking behavior, right? I mean, of course, we validated this before, we didn't do through the trouble of doing all the cellular work, but that is just reproducing what other people have seen. So this is strong here, and it's, 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 it's really at the active level and never at the inactive level. Okay, this is our baseline. Now we're gonna use the projection targeting on the ventral hippocampus. And we apply the one hertz, so this is the one that only normalizes the ventral hippocampus. And then we look and we see that they still nicely distinguish the active from the inactive lever, but they're less motivated. So that reduces the vigor with which they sh look for the cocaine. So there is a first effect. Interestingly, however, is this one here where we do is a 13 hertz protocol at the same input, which if you remember well, is gonna normalize the MPFC input, but not change the ventral hippocampal input. And what you see now is that these mice are still extremely motivated to get the cocaine, but they can no longer distinguish between the active and inactive lever. So the action outcome is totally perturbed. And then, we're gonna do this one here where we do the one hertz on the MPFC, that shouldn't change much, and indeed, it's not significantly different, and we do the last one where we normalize both inputs, and then the behavior is erased, right? So, the, the, the deal here is really that we can do a, uh, a, 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 a deconstruction of this behavior that requires the motivation to go for the lever and requires the distinction between the active and inactive lever. And the interesting thing, and I really what impressed me here is by playing with these specific forms of synaptic plasticity at identified inputs, we could take away either the action outcome or the vigor, or if we reverse both, the behavior is totally gone. Okay, so uh, to summarize, this is a, 
what we have. So uh, I, that's what I just told you. And uh, maybe there are questions at this point. Yes. Why do you do it only once and one day before? What, what happens if you do it during the QC? Okay, so this is, a, this is a good question and I'm happy you, 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 you spotted that point because we actually want to circumvent the critique that we're activating totally without discrimination an entire population of neurons that is never active together during the behavior because that can induce you know, forms of behavior that you don't know exactly how it relates to physiology. So precisely for that reason and because we're exploiting plasticity mechanism, we want to induce this the day before, and when we do the behavior, there's actually no laser stimulation. So this is something that we will see also is extremely powerful if you want to use this in a translational perspective. Yeah, that's, that's good you spotted that. Yes? Then in Paris, thinking discrimination could be for uh, the total hyper of emotion that they just Oh, no, no, yeah, 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 I mean, so little, I mean, we did control for that. Yeah, no, it's not, uh, no, it's not. Yeah. Other things? Okay, so, uh, you know, of course, we have uh, many more synapses that we had to look at. Uh, so this was just a little glimpse at one of the things here. Now there's uh, not only us, but other groups. Uh, above all Marina's group who have contributed massively to especially identifying the role of these calcium permeable AMP receptors in the accumbens. And uh, so slowly there is, a, is an entire picture emerging of a circuit that is changing and it is changing in specific fashion and the different components, the different symptoms that are associated with the addictive behavior can be associated to specific areas in the brain. So we have to realize that, of course, you know, this is trying to put together something that is based on a reductionist approach because we use single symptoms and we look at those, how we can reverse that. But I guess this is it's the reality. We probably cannot fully uh, mimic uh, such a complex disease as addiction in one animal model, so we opted for core components and we look at cue seeking, we look at uh, sensitization and so forth at different elements and this is, uh, this is how we then try to synthesize and put this uh, together. Okay, so now with that we would be at the moment where you you, you, you could discuss this uh, paper a little bit, so I'm gonna just put it up here. Um, and where did I put it? And so if you, and you see then this, 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 the paper that we're gonna be discussing uh, certainly also uh, uh, is touches base with uh, much of what I just uh, told you. Okay, so what's the purpose of the paper here? How does that, uh, what's the motivation of the, of the paper? What was the, uh, yes? To discover that big point where the release of dopamine is pathological to the addiction. Okay, so we want to test whether we sort of could, sh you know, activate the dopamine neurons downstream of the pharmacological action with much higher precision to show that this reinforces behavior, but that this would be sufficient to drive also later stage forms of drug addiction. That is the, that's the, you know, basically testing the dopamine hypothesis in uh, uh, like that. Okay, so we used initially the mouse that I already talked about, which is um, this mouse where channel rhodopsin is selectively expressed in the VTA dopamine neurons and not in the nigra neurons. So that selectivity, that added selectivity, we can obtain by having very specific interactions, uh, injections, and that is shown here in the first uh, figure. So this here is where we injected the uh, channel dopsin. And then, who would like to comment the first uh, figure?
come on, this is not, it can't be wrong. Just, you know, say something. Okay, so the first verification, obviously, is, is that channel rhodopsin really in the Th neuron? So this is under panel A. So, okay, that seems to be the case. And uh, we can estimate that this is the majority of dopamine neurons. Obviously, I'm never 100% sure because the extent of the injection may not cover the entire VTA. But it, it, it is a big chunk of the VTA dopamine neurons. Okay, that's panel A. Panel B. What did we do here? You calibrated the bursts per level press. Yeah, so now we want to we wanna sort of not just have a single shot, but we sort of wanted to have uh, a, an idea on the lower presses, and we calibrated and, uh, and, and, and sort of mimic, uh, and, and so look at the laser stimulation per hour, which would be the most efficient one. Okay, so mimicking uh, the, uh, the uh, mimicking what, uh, what, what addictive drugs might be doing, and mimicking a uh, burst firing pattern that is particularly efficient in driving the, uh, the, um, uh, the release of dopamine. And so I can show you how this looks in reality. Uh, okay. So this is the fine pattern we came up with, right? You have the Q presentation, a five second delay, and then comes the burst firing pattern that lasts 15 seconds. So the entire laser reward takes 20 seconds. This is, of course, to some extent arbitrary. We had to uh, come up with a protocol, and uh, our justification was exactly uh, as was said, is, is based on this, uh, 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 the burst per hours and uh, how they, because if the burst lasts very shortly, they press more often. Right? If the burst is very short, they press ever so often. If the burst is very long, they don't press anymore. And we looked for this uh, inversion of the two curves. Okay, then the next, so that C that I just showed you, and panel D, what does that show? They increase the ratio of pressing um, at the trials of press. Yes, so we, every fourth day, we increase the FR. So we now know what the FR is. So they had to work harder to get that laser reward. And despite the fact that it got harder, it took them less time to get the maximal reward that we fixed to 80. Again, it's to some extent arbitrary, but we wanted to have a maximal reward that we used as a cutoff. And the thing is, every animal learned that. There was one animal that didn't get it, but when we then verified the placement of the uh, injection, it was not in the VTA. Okay, so this is, among the most robust behavioral observations that we've ever had in our lab. Okay, so this is just to establish the, uh, the thing. Then, what was the next figure about? Figure two, what's the purpose? What's, what, what's the message we want to convey with that figure? To see if you can uh, mimic, uh, if cocaine, uh actually give the same result that uh, the direct uh, laser uh, stimulation. So yeah, mimic is probably the, not the best there. word. What would be the word that you want to see is the use of the same circuitry? Yes. And what? Yeah. I don't think the cocaine would have played that legal question because the cocaine would have already taken that wrong relationship. Yeah, so the idea would be if cocaine taps into that same circuit that you activate with the lever stimulation, then a pre-exposure to cocaine should have an effect on how many times they press in a dose-dependent fashion. What's the key word that we use for that kind of experiment? Starts with O. Huh? Occlusion, yes, this is, a, we like that word a lot. So that is, if you do have an observation and you have another manipulation that gives you the same, has an impact on that observation, then the argument is that they share somehow a common pathway, right? And so this is exactly what we see here. 
right? So we increase cocaine and that decreases the number of lever presses and also the number of laser simulation and laser rewards. And when you break it down into the 45 minute session, you see that the time course follows roughly what we know about the kinetics of cocaine. Good, so there is some suggestion that it has something to do with, uh... okay, now figure three. That's an easy one for you now, right? What's the purpose here? Yes. To replicate, well, to, to see if uh, you get the same changes in um, alpha and NDA ratio and our rectification index that you'd seen previously in a non behavior associated paradigm. Exactly. So we want to, you know, if the things converge onto the same, same synaptic mechanism, then this optogenetic self stimulation, which is also totally enforcing, just as cocaine, after the withdrawal here, you know, this is the exact same thing, should lead to Q induced seeking behavior in a situation where the laser is no longer active. This is shown here, indeed. And it should give you the same form of synaptic plasticity if anything was true that I showed you before, right? And it did. That was, we were happy to see that. So here we have again, we have in the D1 MS sense, we have this uh, rectification on the MPFC input and uh, the change in, in, in AMP and NDA ratio, just as we, I mean, it, it was, it's not possible from that data to say whether the animal received cocaine or did laser cell stimulation. It's identical for that matter, okay? And of course, you want to do this in animals where you know whether you record from the D1 or the D2. Again, combining these one D1 tomato, the red one, with the GFP that comes from the ascending fibers this time from the dopamine arms. And you can see that they converge. And so these blue here, these are the nuclei of the non-D1, so presumably the D2 neurons. Okay? Good. And then, and now we're getting, oh, he left, too bad. So now we're getting at the right actual addiction, right? Because we said, okay, because we have a light guide and not an injection system, we can actually do much longer experiments. We can now actually do drug addiction. And the way we wanna do this is by pairing that laser reward with a punishment that comes as, injection, uh, as electric shocks. Okay? And this is exactly what we did here. So here we have past all we've done before. We have a new baseline that is established at day 13 to 15. And then for four days, the laser self-stimulation is paired with punishment. Now that needed an additional addendum to the license, but uh, we got it. It's not, it's not worse than those who do field conditioning. So if uh, it's, uh, it's this. Yeah, 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 we're, we're nice. Yeah. <laughs> we actually, we had, and that's gonna be shown on the next video, we had a way to calibrate the electric shock, which what we used was we used a sucrose reward. And we wanted to have the strength of the electric shock such that sucrose would never be, go beyond the, the, the you know, revo the, the re rewarding despite punishment. And that is what we then used. We'll, we'll see this in the next one. Okay, so now, okay, I, I explained panel A. Who explains panel B? So what's the difference between example one and example two? But you see two kind of groups emerging, one, uh, one group of mice, uh, they're gonna stop. Well, let's let's stay with the example. This is one example well, of a mouse. The example one, the mice uh, doesn't want to, uh, to press uh, for laser stimulation, 
when it has to undergo a punishment. Yeah. So if this mouse is highly motivated to laser stimulation, they get actually to the maximum right after 30 minutes. Okay? And then we introduce, these are the red ticks here, we introduce the punishment, and what does the mouse do? It stops, right? Okay, that's good. You know, punish someone, they don't do what they're punished for. This is what, this is what punishment is for, right? And this mouse here, they continue unabated. I mean, there's absolutely no effect of the punishment. I mean, that it seems also, I mean, sometimes that happens too, right? And the interesting thing is, when we plotted all mice as a function of the session, Right? You see all each, there was not a single mouse that was excluded. Okay? Every mouse was plotted. And what you see is that, yes, there is some effect, particularly during the first two days, but then they actually split into two groups. There are those that follow this example here, zero effect of the punishment, and there are those that have a strong reduction of the self-stimulation. And then there was this one gray mouse here, that really couldn't be classified. Yes? Would you predict that if you increase the severity of the shock that you further struck by the resistant mice? It could be that we, yes, it could be that these would have a different ratio. That is something I'll be happy to discuss, yes. Um, I was wondering about if you compare this paradigm with the human situation, the punishment in humans is more like a consistent punishment because their life is really bad. Sure, let, let, let's maybe leave this to the very end because I mean, you know, this, these are mice, this is a relatively short exposure and yet we have this dichotomy. How that really translates to the human situation is a very difficult question, but I'll, I'll be happy to, to get to that. So if I forget, please remind me. So, okay, so this is, I mean, for me, that was a really uh, uh, eye-opener, right? There you have what is called a bimodal distribution, sensitive and resistant. And that, that at least seems to resemble the human situation, okay? And so, and of course, if you have that, immediately, what is it that you want to do? Huh? No, 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 not, no, I mean, just at the level of the observation, right? You, we see that this is resistant here, but if we could tell it here, that would be great. So there is, is, there, is there something we can pick up in their behavior that would let us, that would allow us to say whether the animal is going to be resistant or sensitive. Well, you look at the liver presses. Huh? You look at the liver presses, uh, like the, you compare the active and inactive liver presses. Well, you died. During which period exactly? Well, just before the, the time period where you can't. Exactly. So we're going to look at what we call the futile lever presses. Right? Because if the animal within this 20 second laser stimulation protocol presses the lever, it's not going to get more lever press and uh, more laser rewards, right? This, these are futile. They, they're, this is work for nothing. And the idea is to look at this uh, here. And we saw that, so the first quartile, the first five seconds, this is when the CS is on and there's no laser reward. And then when it gets blue here, these are the laser rewards, okay? And so during the first four session, there's really zero difference. In the last four session, however, we had a significant higher number of futile lever presses in those animals that became resistant eventually. This is, of course, a little cheating because this is done all retrospectively. Right? We reanalyze the data that we had already obtained. But you know, we write this in the papers. So at least we're cheating, but we're honest about it. So this is then having, and, and the, the sign, you know, the, 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 so, so this may suggest, but this is also something that would have to now be followed up with a direct investigation is that mice that develop an impulsivity, they're more likely to go and become resistant. And there's a huge literature and Trevor Robbins are certainly going to talk about this. And so whether this really represents impulsivity would have to be assessed, but this at least it would be compatible with. Yeah. 
So, I mean, the interpretation that this is like an addicted mouse seems pretty straightforward. I agree with it, but would another interpretation be that they're just stupid? Like, they, <laughs> they don't respond to the shock because they just don't learn it. And they do this futile, futile pressing because they're stupid, like they don't extinguish well or something like that. You know, and here you're getting to semantics. I mean, how do I, I mean, stupid or addicted, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, what ultimately drives the motivation of the animal to resist the punishment, it's difficult to say, yeah. But if you take sort of this operational definition of compulsive use despite negative consequences, there is some evidence that we fulfill this. And I'm sure we can discuss this with Trevor, and I'm sure he'll, he'll be more skeptical and say, this is not really addiction, you know? Yeah. Ask him about it. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yes, Marina. I think there's some studies when people have compared food and drug. Yeah, look at resistance to punishment as you manipulate all sorts of variables, and I think you can pull them apart. So I think that's an argument that it's not um, an inability to learn effectively. Yeah. OK, so this is exactly also in part what we did in the next figure, because you know, by that time we said, well, maybe we should touch base again with the real thing, that is cocaine. And now that we knew that something like that is possible, we actually geared up and we did the self-administration despite all the technical issues. And uh, as you can see here, with the cocaine, we also have two groups, OK? So same thing here, the punishment is associated with cocaine self-administration. But, and again, we have an idea that maybe there are some futile lever presses that could predict the animal that will become resistant. And this is what I already told you, this is the uh, sucrose self-administration that we uh, use to calibrate the intensity of the shocks. And here, you have the direct comparison of how many animals are resistant and how many are sensitive. And so, what is the, what's your reading of this panel F? Yes, you can. Say what your reading is of the panel F. <laughs> so what do we plot here? Now just describe it, Not, you're already concluding. So what is the, what's, what's the, what, what do we describe here? It's the F, right? Yeah, panel F. Yeah, so the filled, which filled is very high in the case of direct stimulation of the polynergic neurons, which is much lower present in case of cocaine and very low in case Yeah, of exactly. So here with the dopamine neuron self-stimulation, we have about 70% resistance. Here we have 20% with the cocaine. And bingo, this is exactly what the magic number is that I showed you in the beginning, right? So. Uh, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but uh, this is, is certainly, you know, has some face validity for the human condition. You should sell this to drug addicts. Yes. yes, exactly. So this is the point where we try to realize that we actually are after a super addiction, and we maybe have good ideas how to improve drugs, not how to, <laughs> right? The thing is, it's not going to be the ERC funding us, but uh, some people in uh, Sicily, right? So. Okay, so now, I mean, sure, that's just, uh, that's the observation. Okay, so, at that point, so there's, this is a collaboration between an MD-PhD student and a postdoc. And at that point, the MD-PhD student said, I'm going to go back to neurology, we have to submit the paper, right? Um, which, uh, which we did, and that was a mistake. It came back immediately. So what was wrong with the paper? You don't have any explanation of uh, what it is. Exactly, zero mechanistic explanation, it's pure correlation. So, uh, you know, this is hopeless. I, uh, I should have resisted and said, no way are we going to submit that paper. Okay, but I was too nice, and, uh, and we submitted the paper. And when it came back, we said, okay, now we really have to go and look what, what, is, uh, what, is, what is different. And what we then did is uh, 
well, there were some you know, detours, but so I'm going to give you the easy version of it. We said, OK, now we have to find a region where we actually have a change in activity that distinguishes the resistant from the sensitive. And uh, one of the issues was that obviously, um, I can show you this here maybe with the movie, is that uh, now here you see such a mouse uh, self-stimulating and then getting the uh, shock. Right, Duck. and this one goes back and does it again. Okay, so this is 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 uh, is the way we did the behavior, and obviously, one difficulty was that uh, between the resistant and the sensitive, there was also the number of electric shock that was different. Right? No. Because the resistance, they will get more shocks. So there is a clear confound that we had to control for. Right? What if it's not the motivation to press the lever, but it is the, just the number of shock that makes the difference that we're looking for? How did we control for that? What? Yoked. Well, this is a word. What, <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? I mean, the control group that is getting Yeah, so, so this, is the, uh, this is the experimental setup. We have the animal that's self-administered, that is trained, and that is paired with a yoked animal that sits in the cage next door, has never seen a laser reward, and gets, however, each time the animal above gets a shock, gets a shock as well. This is really a mean experiment, right? But uh, this is how we control for the number of shocks which of course didn't you know, make the paper easier because now we had to use five groups, right? So you have to have the naive, the resistant, the sensitive, the yolk to resistance, and the yolk to sensitive. And we used CFOS in 15 different regions quantification to get an idea where there could be something that would show us a difference between the resistance and the sensitive, but not between the yoked resistance and the yoked sensitive. Because if you, you know, who wants to describe panel A, the, the top, the examples, the top and the bottom? Yes? There are more phosphoritics cells in the prelimpic cortex. Yeah, so there are more in the resistant than in the naive, and there are more in the resistant than in the sensitive. But <coughs> if you look at the yolk, there's also more in the yolk than in the sensitive. I mean, this is clearly visible, right? So this is not, this is a region that might actually code more for the number of shocks or the pain perception then actually the motivation to do what it's supposed to do. So we don't want to go there. This is not interesting. Funny enough, this is the, re this is the region where a lot of human research and a lot of additional research indicates that the MPFC or the prelimbic area of the MPFC may actually code for that. So uh, yeah, we'll have, we have something that is not exactly in, in, in line of the major dogma in the addiction field. But we found other regions where there was what? If you now look at the second, the lateral OFC. There is no difference between the yolk, resistant and sensitive, not much, at least from here. Yeah, so in the, you have the difference between the resistant and the sensitive, but not between the two yolk. And we could then quantify this by calculating this ratio where you have the resistance over sensitive divided by the yolk resistance over yolk sensitive expressed everything as fault naive and color coded. So the more it is red, the more it is the region we're really interested in. Who wants to comment this one here? Yeah. 
Panel B? Yes. Uh, your sort of gradient is uh, from light to dark on the right, which shows the variable pole change on the left as we go to the conjunct towards the right over. There's a big pole difference as you identify the platform uh, the, uh, from the pole press medial as well as um, to uh, medial and passing media as being high as well as I can't really see these yet. Yeah, so. okay, okay, and what, what are these two here? The VTA. Why, why is the VTA here? Why did we find a huge difference between resistant and sensitive in the VTA that apparently was not present in the yaw? Is that a surprise? Is that huh? what? No. First, no one says a word, and everybody together. So, you you wanted to say. Exactly, you know? And in the interest of full disclosure, I actually, I, I forgot this. And when I saw it, I knew why. But it's not something we predicted. So, you know, shame on us. But of course, that is exactly what had to be the case, right? OK? Because everybody understands why? Right? Because it's only there where you have optogenetic stimulation. So optogenetic stimulation, the direct stimulation drives the CFOS, and only in those mice that have the fiber implanted, which was not, never the case in the York. So da, this is how it, uh, that's good. Yeah. OK. And then, uh, how do you, OK, now we sent the paper back. It was again rejected. Now we're really getting desperate, you know? So what was the, if you were the referee and you received the paper at that stage, after figure, what was it, figure five? Six, already six figures, right? That's good. Lots of stuff, lots of panels. But they returned it immediately. Go see what's happening in the UFC now. Mm. Well, okay, you could say, I want to know more mechanism, but that was not the major reason. Huh? Can you reverse the behavior by like... Yes, because at the stage I showed you after figure six, the entire story is purely correlative. We have no evidence that the activity in the OFC truly is causally implicated in the behavior. So now, obviously, what do we need to do? First, of course, oh, yeah, no, sorry, we had also figure seven at that initial submission. That's just the electrophysiological comparison that also shows this changes in the OFC that is not reflected in the uh, yacht, but uh, that there was in the uh, PFC, was, there was this change, right? That's, so we, we, we submitted after figure seven, but so it's still, still rejected. So now what we have to do is we have to, from within, manipulate the activity of the OFC and make either a resistant mouse sensitive or a sensitive resistant. Which one, which way would you go? Huh? What, what makes you say it's easier? That's what I was guessing. So you would go from sensitive to resistant. Okay, but strategically, when it comes to publishing, of course you want to make it to the opposite. But I think it's more difficult. Yeah, so for reasons of political correctness, we chose to go from resistant to sensitive and not from sensitive to resistant. So sometimes as a scientist, you have to compromise with society. OK, and how do we do this after? after Garrett's lecture? Optogenetics. No, why not? I mean, we could have done optogenetics. Yes, yeah, so we already have optogenetics in there, and uh, you know, it, it doesn't make it easier, sure. And we wanted to have a sort of a sustained inhibition. So we were, you know, the prediction is you had to inhibit 
the neurons of the OFC, and that would transfer a resistant into a sensitive one. And if you wanted to do this over prolonged periods of time, you, our bet was that uh, the, the uh, chemogenetic approaches might be more efficient. Okay. So, since I said that uh, for the chemogenetics you have to validate that it actually might work, we first cut slices and showed, yes, indeed, the, uh, the, the, the dread is in the neurons of the OFC. Then we, in the bath, in the, in the slice preparation, we put on the CNO, the agonist for this artificial receptor. And what do we see here is an outward current that is inhibited by barium and therefore most likely carried by... No, an occult. <laughs> what? Outward current elicited by GIO receptor. These are the GERD currents, the potassium channel, the G protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channels. Huh? Just as the calcium permeable amp receptors, these channels are inwardly rectifying for the same reason because of the polyamines and so forth. Okay? But here we see them as outward current. So on average, we got about 100 picograms, and that shifted our input output curve. And here we show that we know where the OFC is. Okay, so now, okay, now I, I did that figure for you. So who is going to tell us the last figures? What do we do in panel E? You did the same protocol as before, but yes. now you use punishment with yes. the CNO in sessions 16, 17, 18, 19. Yes. And, and that gives you this result yes. here. You see uh, that the animals, uh, they stop pressing the lever when it's the, C the zero, you are inhibiting the behavior. Yeah. And then you did uh, an internal control with, this, with the same animal, so you are now doing the punishment with bagel, and you see that the behavior is reverted. After without we wash out the CNO, yes. and without CNO, the very same animal, and we see that the distribution is very different, okay? So that allows us to do what is shown here in panel G. We can compare between groups. So this is actually the same data that we had before and within groups, okay? And this is entirely consistent that the CNO reduces the fraction of resistance. And what do we do here? Huh? The tail flick, yes. So what, what's the idea there? Well, the long, you see the latency of the response, essentially, when you, uh, you put them as if it's the hot, uh, right? Is it? No, I guess this is tail immersion, right? So yes, this is just a hot bath, either at 50 or 55 degrees. And you put the, the tail of the mouse there and you wait you measure the time until it takes the tail out of the water. Because at 50 degrees, at one point, it starts to hurt. And you take this as a measure for, well, not analgesia, just pain perception, right? And why do we do this? Yeah, so we want to know whether between the resistant, the sensitive, or with and without CNO, the pain perception would be altered, and that uh, does not seem to be the case. Okay? Whew, good, huh? So, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the end. Now we sent it back, and then it was eventually accepted. So just to, you know, show you that uh, these things are not, uh, this is not something that is always... Uh, straightforward and uh, it takes time to do all these experiments. And uh, it takes, above all, a very committed group of uh, many uh, people. So, uh, um, so Vincent and Jean, who is now really left us, you know, he was not only threatening to leave us, he actually left. And they did together the, all, the whole paper here, the self uh, Stimulation. Vincent was also the one 
on the initial paper, I told you about the dissociation between the, uh, the PFC. Um, uh, there's a lot of earlier work of people who are no longer here. Uh, well, you recognize Julie is still here. And uh, Megan uh, is very instrumental for, if we at one point find half an hour, I'll tell you a little bit about how we try to take advantage of what we've learned into translation. But I guess for today, you're saturated. <laughs> Good, so this is, uh, yeah, and then we spend lots of money from the European community and from the Swiss National Science Foundation. That's also important to have the money.